I think an, an, another fantastic Christmas film, which I think is, is absolutely worth watching, is a remake of Holiday Inn, which was a 1946-47 film, but it, you know, it was called White Christmas. Um, and with uh, Bing Crosby, Danny Kaye, Rosemary Clooney, um, Vera... Vera Ellen. Somebody, but, Vera Ellen. Vera Ellen. Yeah, which, again, is just one of these great feel-good films, which, again, deals with some very similar aspects to It's a Wonderful Life. It deals with friendship. It deals with... It deals with, it deals with the, the emotions of people who are so connected to somebody else and are prepared to put themselves out to help friends. So it does... It, it, if we looked, I mean, the last the last film we looked at was uh, "It's a Wonderful Life." I would absolutely recommend "White Christmas" as something which is another film to watch for its simple its simple storyline, its simple dialogue, and it's spectacular in terms of its color um, and the dance scenes and the the costume and the singing, which which is you know just just a great film to watch. Right, this is a remake, not an identical remake, but the original story was uh, another film, a black and white film, just after the war, 47, 48, which was called Holiday Inn, which had very much the same themes. Um, white Christmas is probably the more well-known. It's in colour. Um, and again, just for a language learner, very simple. Very simple in terms of the dialogue. There's no, um, it's not a difficult film to follow, I don't think. Uh, the storyline is really simple. It's the pictures again take you through. It's very, it's the cutting process, the cutting pattern is very slow. Um, it's a sort of, it's a semi musical. Is it a pure musical? Du, 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 du. I'm not sure. It's a, but it's, I mean, it's yeah. very heavily influenced by right i would theater. call it more like a semi-musical because a musical to me and i'm not like a total expert but a musical is like when all the characters spontaneously just start singing and dancing but this is more that they're the the music is in different acts or different like they they're singing different songs so it's not this whole thing where the whole entire amount of people just start singing randomly <laughs> and dancing yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and obviously because it's based upon the fact there's a theatre troupe. Yeah. Again, I mean, this, this, this film starts in the middle of World War II. I mean, White Christmas obviously starts during, well, at a concert uh, in World War II with uh, General Waverley and the other, you know, the, the, the rest of the protagonists, you know, Bing Crosby, Danny Kaye on stage entertaining the troops. <laughs> And you see their respect, love for um, the general in terms of him being just a person they look up to. And then obviously the war finishes and um, Danny Kay uh, and, and Bing Crosby kind of go their own way in terms of going into the, or going back into the entertainment industry. And they then sort of, they, through a whole series of events, they end up obviously in uh, in Vermont, which is a place I really want to go and visit. I think just because of the name, <laughs> and they end up at this this inn um, with a couple of uh, couple of the dancers from one of their shows, or from f who they know as a result of the entertainment industry they are in. Uh, uh, and the the situation is they again meet up with the general and instantly you can see that the respect they have for him, the love they have for him, and just the... Well, because they always drop back into that situation of being back in World War II where they're saluting him uh, and sort of referring to him by his, his, his kind of official name. But obviously, he's now become the janitor. He's, a, he's the owner of this, this um, hotel, which is in, in, having a bad time because the, the winter hasn't arrived. The snowing, the, 
that the skiing season hasn't arrived. General Waverly. Sir. At ease. How are you, Captain? I'm fine, General, but... We just try to keep the general part quiet. Why? Uh, begging your pardon, sir. Well, to put it in one sentence, people don't expect a major general to carry firewood. Uh, and their efforts to help him out and generate, um, what would you call it, uh, a tourist kind of influx for his, for his hot, for his hotel, for his inn. So again, it's, I think it follows some very similar seat, very, very similar idea from It's a Wonderful Life in that real friends want to help out somebody who was so instrumental to them during a very difficult period of their lives during the war. So um, I don't know, how did you, how did you find this film? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on the film in terms of... Yeah, I mean, I think at the beginning, I was like, I felt it to be a little bit of a slow start. But then as I got into it, I really liked it. Uh, but I was like, oh, like at the beginning, the war scene, I mean, that was interesting. It reminded me of like, kind of like Bob Hope. And I guess that some of the songs were kind of like um, similar where, you know, the whole entertaining the troops kind of thing. Um, and... You know, then they kind of, um, I think they get together as, as, a, as a duet because one was injured and saved the other and said, oh, you know, could you help me out? Let's be a duet. And once I'm really just a one man show, but they ended up working together and being this duet thing. They're down in Florida and some reason the brother of the sisters write to him and say, can you check out my sister's act? Ladies and gentlemen, the Haynes sisters. Can you imagine Freckleface having sisters as cute as that? It's incredible. But it really wasn't them. It was one of the sisters that wrote. And they <laughs> went to go check out the sister act, and then they ended up, like, helping them out and helping them get to Vermont, where they were supposed to have be in their next gig. Um, oh, yeah. when they got to Vermont, like, as you said, the snow, there's like here right now, I'm looking out the window, there's no snow and Vermont, there's no snow. And that's a big thing. Like in the winter is snow for skiing and probably why people would go to Vermont. Um, so without snow, the, you know, this inn was not doing very well. No one was there. Um, and when they got there and noticed the general, he's like, don't call me general. Like I'm carrying the, the wood and I'm like, I'm doing all this stuff. And he sunk all this money into this hotel. Um, so as you said, they wanted to kind of help him out. So they called up their whole entire cast of, um, of their <laughs> show in New York city, I guess, and had them like, oh, we're going to practice here at the hotel. That's right, that's it. All right, keep living. Um, and so it was just wonderful. Like you said, everybody kind of helping out their friends in need and the, the general was in need. But they also did it in a way because they didn't want at all for the general to feel like it was a charity thing. Um, and there was this whole thing where they were going to be on a very famous television show that the general always watches. So they had to kind of get him away from the television. Put your weight on it. No, 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 sir. I, oh, oh, oh. Uh, fine, sir. Oh, oh. Thank you, thank you. And now it's a great privilege to present my special guest. An old pal from Army days, a great guy and a great entertainer, Bob Wallace. Because they were going to call all his former troops there from the war to come to Vermont and be able to sing that song. There's a song that they sing to him. I forget what the name of it is. But there's like this song that they sang to him in, in the first scene and they sing to him again. And I think another song, but you really don't want to hear me singing it. So, no, right? <laughs> Um, 
the music by Urban Berlin, which um, he's yeah, a great well, composer. Well, yes. And yes. Um, another interesting thing to me was that there never was a song, sound official soundtrack because one of the sisters was, I think she was, um, you know, she had a contract with Columbia and this is a Paramount picture. So all the songs like that they that they released had to probably be dubbed and had someone else sing in for her because she couldn't be on the um, soundtrack. Just a little one of those trivia things that I was reading this morning. Yeah, that kind of goes back to something which in uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Um, Mary was at, on contract to another studio and she was loaned for the film. So obviously it's something they did, but yeah, I suspect that would be a case that because she was from another studio, releasing right. an official soundtrack would, would be a problem. I mean, I, whether that's still the case today, I don't I know. I think Since back then, the different studios had their own actors and actresses that were in contract with that studio. Yeah. So you would never see certain actors and actresses together because they would only be working for Paramount or they'd only be working for Columbia and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not really the case now. Um, and then what else? Oh, Vista, it, maybe you could speak to how this was this new like format of this Vista vision. Like it was like a, I think never done before. Um, I think some sort of like way that the format was gonna be better. Mm. I don't know if you know much about that, but I, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, initially the framing was kind of four by three and then they they kind of went to huge letter, like Panor Panavision was just, huge widescreen so they've, they've kind of changed the aspect ratio i mean television today is all shot 16 by 9. yeah all days it was four by three and that's kind of what they were doing they were using different aspect ratios for to give it a, to give it a, a different look to films i'm going to come back slightly again to if you look at white christmas all the major scenes they're all shot in the studio they're right. all shot in the studio. i mean there's very very little is shot outside, from what I recall. Even the the initial battle scene, where they, you know, where they're in this this village. Being shelled, but they're holding the concert. It's it's a it's a studio, quite typical of, of those days to build these studios. It's quite obvious that it's a studio, but you know, um, everything's studio based. But I think the thing which I kind of quite enjoy is the fact that when they're at the generals, oh sorry, <laughs> yeah, when they're at the generals um, in and they're practicing, those sets are just the most amazing sets. I mean, this is supposed to be a barn, but it's just <laughs> you know just. Who cares about the reality of this? It's just like, this is a film. You just take it as big as you can. So you've got like 50 dancers and you've got some amazing set and you've got all of these things happening, which would take a proper theater to organize. This is all happening in this barn. I mean, you know, you just... <laughs> You know, uh, reality is just thrown out of the window to just create this beautiful illusion of uh, what these people are doing for the general. You know, all of these, all of these cast and crew, and uh, you know, Ben Crosby and Danny Kay. You know, they're, they're the main protagonists. What they're all doing to help the the general, but it's just an excuse in some respects to lavishly create this pseudo kind of musical situation where. Um, everybody singing and dancing and going through these most elaborate numbers with most beautiful dresses and um, costumes. It, it's, yeah, I mean, how much of it is just about, is it a vehicle for um, the main protagonist in terms of their ability to sing and dance? Right. Uh, I mean, because you could take all of that out and you still have a film. Right, exactly. still, uh, You know, it's just like, it's there to elaborate. I suppose in some respect, it's there just to pack the film out. Um, because it, you could take it out of the film and it would still work. You could have just left it as a, as a couple of shots. But no, these are entire routines of singing and dancing. They are. I think that's what made the film because I, like, and probably what the parts that I had seen in the past were the actual dance parts, the singing parts and stuff. Um, when you talk about the set, what I read was that 
it was the same set they used in Holiday Inn, but that was just in black and white. So they had to color it because it was just painted to just be for black and white. So they had to repaint it all. And that it was actually in Connecticut, I think. Um, but in any case, that it was this this set that was initially for Holiday Inn, but they just like, they repainted it because it's now going to be filmed in color. Oh, okay. I, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that. Again, that was another one of these trivia things that I was reading this morning. Um, it's that one of these websites, not Wikipedia, but it's, um, what do you call it? It's IBD. Uh, IBDM. Yes. They have like a whole trivia section. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Um, brilliant. I mean, I suspect that in those days, just because you could use sets again and again, because they're basically just frontages. Um, so, you know, something you just put into into storage and bring out as needs be. I mean, obviously, um, I think in this particular area as well, um, song and dance movies were pretty big. So, again, this is a great, it's a great um, vehicle for, one, just a great story, and two, mm -hmm. to bring in and use the song and dance element, which would have been, you know, one of the things which would bring audiences in. Um, and I suspect the... Again, it's been a few years since I've seen Holiday Inn, so television would not have been part of that film. I'd have to, I'm going to have to have a look at Holiday Inn. I do actually have it on DVD, so it might be my homework after this to sit down and watch Holiday Inn and try and see how big a difference it is between that and White Christmas. But I do know that it's the, it's the, the, concept, the concept is the same. Um, I'm trying to remember who the main actors were in the original film. I think, um, I think it was Fred Astaire, and they wanted Fred Astaire to be in White Christmas, but he was ha partly retired. They wanted it to be a reunion, kind of Ben Crosby and Fred Astaire, but Fred Astaire. Yeah, yeah. I think Danny Kaye was brought in to, to cover because uh, he was available, and also another another big star of the era. But yeah, um, but again, you know. Remakes of films are not unusual. Um, this obviously, quite often the remake is never as good as the original. Um, I think White Christmas is, from what I recall, is much better. I love the colour of White Christmas as well. Just um, the, the film that they used in those days just has such a beautiful, um, soft, subtle tones within its colour palette. And it looks lovely. It looks absolutely lovely. I really, I do like early color films that they've, they've got a they've got a particular color palette which is just very pleasant to watch um and, and that that you know there would have been very little treatment in that in terms of an any well apart from just general color grading um you know unlike today's films where there's lots of cgi and they mix colors and they add effects afterwards these these films would have been fairly simple because they'd have to be pushing them out at a, at a rate of not to create to to to, to fulfill a desire in those days, because obviously the cinema was still big for most people. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was, a, it was the thing you would do, even though television had come in. I mean, you know, television was like- Very small, right? Time. And so you want to see it right. big. Yeah, and, you want to see- Yeah, and then uh, like this one, as opposed to their first one, this one was a, a big success for the box office. They, they did really make their money back on this one. And then some, like, it was like one of the most successful films of that year. Yeah, I mean, when, you, when, you've got, when you've got when you've got Bing Crosby and Danny Kay, uh, Rosemary Clooney, and the other lady I can't remember, Vera um, Ellen, I mean, Vera Ellen. I mean, massive, massive stars in the day. I mean, you know, they were they were big. They were absolute. I mean, I don't know um, household names in the way like Leonardo DiCaprio is today. I mean, you know, people who everybody just knows. And if a film comes out, everybody wants to go and see that film because. He or she, this you know, this these modern actors are in it. So they were a massive box office draw for 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 any main studio to have. So yeah, I can see why White Christmas was a big hit with a with a cast like that and a story like that. Uh, again, a massive feel good Christmas film. And I think one of the famous what they call the crooners, like Ben Crosby. Um, you know, Ben Crosby, Dean Martin, what Dean Martin wasn't in it, but the ones that I think of are the holiday crooners, which is a type of singing, mm -hmm. right? Is like Ben Crosby is one of the top ones. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, again, I mean, he was, he was a, a massive star in his own right as a singer. So, you know, and again, we, you know, 
on radio. He would have been pretty much being played fairly constantly, I would have thought. Um, as you, you're right, the crooners of that era, the bands of that era were all household names um, because there was nothing else to watch. There was nothing else to listen. So these people had a, a fairly captive audience, I would, have, I, I would have suspected, in those days. But yeah. they were brilliant anyway. So, I mean, you yeah. know, um, so, I mean, yeah, I'd have to agree that having those crooners, having those major stars, not only in terms of the film industry, in terms of just being great actors, but also being big as in another field, as in singing, so the, the, the record business at the time. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like I said, just outside of being fantastic films across the board, both of them, the simplicity of the, 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 the filming allows you to concentrate on the dialogue, I think if you're watching things which are really fast paced, really fast cut, you spend more of your, your brain's desperately trying to follow every piece of information there is rather than just following the dialogue, which is simple. I mean, it's not, this isn't rocket science dialogue. This isn't a difficult plot to follow. All of these plots, all of these plots, you can see what's happening. You, you can, you know, it's, it's just so obvious. It's so obvious. And I think that allows you, somebody who's non-native to, to, to potentially follow the, 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 the dialogue track a lot easier. And then invariably not talking on top of each other. So you're not fighting with people talking on top of each other, talking fast with um, mountains of uh, sound effects. Yeah. And it's clear speech. So I think it, it, they work on both levels. They work because they're just great films. And on the second level, the dialogue is simple and the post-production is limited. So the dialogue generally is very, very clear. And I think that will make it um, perfect for those with a good level of English to be able to follow and get through that hour, hour and a half, hour 45 of a film and be able to follow the entire plot and not be lost by... Mm -hmm fast dialogue, um, heavy sound effects, muffled, muffled dialogue, which seems to be a problem. I mean, I'm watching modern films and I'm struggling to understand what's going on because of the, the speed of delivery, the muffled dialogue, the use of lots and lots of layered sound effects, which just cover up so much of what's been said. So, yeah, I, I think... If, when I'm watching fil Spanish films, the, the, the cleaner the audio dialogue is, the simpler the audio dialogue, the easier I can follow. If I get into something which has got a lot of effects, a lot of sound, a lot of fast cutting, it makes it much more difficult for me to actually follow what, what the film's about. And uh, that's why I would personally recommend these two films and a lot of other films, I think, of the era, they're probably easier to follow, but these are just classics in their own right even today these films are absolute classics despite the fact they are now 70 odd year old yes they hold, they hold up today they hold up as beautiful pieces of filmmaking beautiful pieces of storytelling and heartwarming because of the the, the storyline of friends helping friends and this not being about Christmas, this not being about this festification, but this is just the, the basic story about if you've got great friends, help. You don't need money. You don't need massive possessions. Great friends can count for so much more. And these both these films deal with this subject in a slightly different way, but cover the, cover the same subject. So yeah, I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop here because I just think brilliant films to watch and absolutely recommended, not just to non-natives. But to natives who haven't seen them. And if you haven't seen them, where were you? Which rock were you hiding under? Seriously, right. which rock were you hiding under? Because uh, as you say, um, uh, I think it's they're a translated life. in many, like I think that I was oh. watching some movie where they're watching a Spanish movie and they're watching, you know, It's a Wonderful Life in Spanish. So I think that they're, they've been dubbed and whatnot in many languages. So again, what rock were you hiding under if you haven't seen it? <laughs> Yeah, I think I mean, I suppose that's the point again as well today is that the ability to draw up subtitles on these films if needs be. So, yeah, absolutely two brilliant recommendations. It's a Wonderful Life and White Christmas. And if you're looking for a comparison, try White Christmas and Holiday Inn and see how where the storylines, where White Christmas derives its main storyline from. 
Okay. All right. Well, those are great suggestions. And thank you again. And I look forward to our next conversation. No, brilliant. Absolute pleasure talking to you again. Um, I love talking about old films. So yeah, let's do it again soon. All right. 